quick background painting tip that feels illegal but isn't. It's something that I've been doing to unblock my creativity when I was feeling uninspired. Say, you really want to paint this epic perspective you have in your mind but whenever you start from scratch you miss the proportions and stuff just make no sense. One thing that you can do, to cheat the system, is to find a photo with the perspective you like, copy paste into your program and paint on top of it. First, you will put down the guidelines of the perspective. Because you already have the image in it will be much easier to imagine the right scale that should be there. You can even extend your canvas to whatever size you want because of that photo base. Disclaimer, I'm not telling you to copy the photo, I'm saying use the photo as your guide for your own design. To practice your creativity or the understanding of how perspective works, of course, you have to practice doing this from scratch. You won't always find that perfect perspective photo, but I found it very useful for practice and beating art blocks. Happy painting. This is what you should do if you ever have art block. First, scribble randomly with washable markers, and then add little droplets of water to mess it up and take it out of your control. Now free draw inspired by the marker without worrying about what it looks like. This will get you drawing and inside the creative spirit without getting inside your own head. Genuine things my art teacher told me that actually held back my art. By the way, I'm not trying to say that they were bad people or bad teachers or anything like that, I just disagree with these things that they said. This one I've actually heard a lot of teachers say, and it's that you can't leave any white space in the background of your pieces. And I always thought the importance of negative space in artwork was similar to the importance of silence in music. But I guess art teachers disagree. Now I can see why some teachers might say this, but as general advice, it's really harmful to artists, as it tells them that everything needs a full background when it doesn't. For example, this piece for A-level I think would look really weird with a background, and I'm kind of glad I didn't add one. And this is one of my favourite paintings that I've ever done. For a long time after my art teacher said this, lots of my paintings backgrounds looked like this. While I like it and I really like the style of it, I just think it's a bit too tight, a bit too out of focus. And I think it's just a bit too try hard to fill up the whole space of the paper. And don't get me wrong, I love painting like this, but I've come to accept that you can leave white space in paintings. In conclusion, leave as much white space Does your art look weird from far away? You know, you're doing a drawing, it looks great, but then you export it, maybe post it on your Instagram, and then from afar it just looks off? Well, I could save you a lot of grief with just a really simple tip that I wish I knew earlier. I present to you the concept of thumbnail sketches. They're usually bare bones drawings of different compositions for your final piece. They give you a lot of options as to what you really want the direction to go in. These are used a lot by industry professionals. They really help the artists and other viewers look at the final piece and see if anything is missing. This combined with zooming out regularly will really help. Start with light pressure. Focus on the light and dark values. Use bright colors to make it pop. Keep adding layers, be patient. Pressing harder towards the end to help blend. Give this a go. Art tips, let's go. Let me show you a simple exercise that will help you understand and practice perspective drawing. First, let's go online and find a photo of a room, any room that looks nice, and try to find something where the vertical lines are straight. Try to find something with visible ceiling and four lines. This will be your main guideline. Now you want to draw in the perspective lines. This will help you understand how the lines work and how the objects behave in that space. Do draw them by yourself without using any templates. After all, we are practicing. And when you have all of your lines, Lines, draw in your vanishing point and a horizon line. When you are done with that, you can now think of some objects and draw them inside that room. 
I'd start with books because they're pretty simple, just boxes, you know. You can draw in a table, a frame on the wall, a chair, a drawer, whatever seems doable at the beginning. Don't stress too much and take it easy. Try to add as much as you can and refer back to your perspective lines. A few of these exercises and you will be able to move around those places pretty comfortably. I know that helped me and I hope that will help you as well. How to get better at drawing poses. Part 1. There is a good exercise you can do to improve your poses very quickly. It's called quick poses. Some people might refer to it as gesture drawing, although it's not really the same thing. But the idea is, you set a timer for let's say 15 seconds and you try to draw the pose. And after those 15 seconds you move on to the next one. Now why is this exercise so good? Simply because you have no time to overthink it. You are forced to put the pose down within seconds, no raising, no thinking, no measuring, simply taking a glance, drawing a few lines and then you move on. And at the beginning of doing this exercise you will be probably feeling extremely overwhelmed, you might not even draw any lines. <laughs> But after a few poses, your brain will eventually start to simplify the shapes that you're looking at and you'll begin to draw better poses. Why I like this exercise so much is because you are kind of forced to let go of the fear of failure and fear that it might not look as good because one, you don't really have the time to be scared because you have to draw the pose and two, because when you draw a crappy pose you don't have the time to think about whether or not you did well because you have to draw the next one. And then when you look collectively at, at your 5 or 10 minute practice, which if you do one pose per 15 seconds, that will be between 20 to 40 poses. You have so many of them that it's not going to be a big deal anyway, because you're going to find good ones and bad ones. And yeah, so in the next part I will tell you about four different ways you can do this exercise. And if you are here before that video is out, you can go to my blog where I already posted all about it and I also included links to the websites that I like that have this option of a timer. Hope that helps. Happy painting. Alright, listen, you dumb dumb bubblegum looking head ass. Hmm? You. You wanna get better at drawing? Of course you do. That's why you follow me. Duh. Well, I'ma tell you what you young artists need to stop doing in 2021 part, I think there's two or three, whatever. One, all right, listen closely. Y'all just need to stop whining. Stop whining, all right? Stop saying you're not good enough. Stop saying you'll never get to a certain goal that you know you wanna be at because that's annoying because you're just putting yourself down, stop. Step two or thing two that you need to stop doing. Stop buying multiple sketchbooks for no reason and only drawing halfway into them and throwing them out. Focus on one and really focus and really get into it. Saves you money too. Remember, big brain. Three, the last one. And this goes for both ways. If you're a digital artist, try traditional. If you're a traditional artist, try digital. Don't be so linear, okay? This is the best tip for learning how to do character design even if you are just starting to learn to draw. Always be designing. And I'm gonna give you a way to do that. The best way to always be designing is to think in terms of big, medium, and small. If you're designing shapes, you want big, medium, and small shapes. Lines, you want big, medium, and small lines. Even if you're working on something like color, when you think in character design in terms of big, medium, and small, you would have one dominant color that would take over most of the character, that's your big, then medium shapes of a different color, and small details of another color. This is why it's good for you to always be designing, because the earlier that you start thinking in these terms, the easier it's going to be for you to design in the future. I'll show some specific examples in another video today, so follow if you want to learn more. Here's the most important piece of art advice I'll ever give. If you try to make everything perfect, your mistakes will stick out and you'll worry about them. Starting loose and defining and polishing later rather than at the beginning will allow you to hide your mistakes in style. Never try to be perfect the first time. You'll only ever disappoint yourself. Here are three mistakes I made in my first stages as an artist and entrepreneur. Mistake number one, not having enough presentations to send your clients. You need to have a professional website. You should have a PDF document that outlines either your portfolio, your packages, your process, your pricing, 
or all four of the above. Mistake number two, trying to do too many things at once, not specializing and becoming a master at one thing. When you become a master at whatever you're doing or selling, you're able to deliver the best results. You're also able to ask educated questions to your clients and give insightful answers. You also won't feel scattered because you're not trying to do so many things at once. And lastly, trying to do everything on my own. You need to leverage connections outside of yourself, whether it's on social media, by meeting friends within your niche, by meeting a mentor, or by finding some sort of guidance. You'll learn much faster from learning from others' mistakes instead of having to make the mistakes yourself and correct them. This is just a little quick tip for artists that have art blog. This helped me stay consistent for like the past month, painting damn near every day. So if you're interested, then check this out. Look online for art competitions, art contests, art city jobs, or art galleries that you can submit yourself into. Doing that kind of puts like a standard outside of your own to work on your art. Especially if you submit to these things with like weeks in advance before it actually happens. It kind of puts that like in the back of your head that, oh, somebody is expecting my great work to actually be seen somewhere. I did this recently. I signed up for an art gallery. It was really local. It was in Houston. And I ended up painting with high expectations before the show. And then when I saw everyone else's amazing work, it inspired me to continue creating at that same level after the show, as if I'm gonna be in another show already. Welcome to Artist Spice, no one ever told me, part two. Stop drawing with lines. I know that's kind of weird advice, but hear me out. When you are drawing a line, you are defining an area of contrasting point. And theoretically, in actual life, there are no lines. You just simply see the difference between one object to the other. But we artists take that and construct that in an artificial form. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with drawing that way. Everyone starts off like that. I, I don't know anyone who hasn't. However, the more and more I drew with lines, the more I understood that it's very limiting to understanding your subject matter, especially when drawing organic subjects. So if if you're somebody who has only ever drawn lines ever, I highly recommend taking a painting class or understanding how painting works. The biggest thing that I've taken away from painting is understanding that shape language is much more important than line dynamic. And that in itself will help you construct much more natural and organic pieces. And this skill and mindset will come back to you when you come back to draw with lines because then you understand that dynamic in a different level. So just try making something without lines for once. Five cool art tricks in one minute or less, part two. Number one, you can use an X-Acto knife to create individual hairs when drawing with colored pencil. Number two, you can use a white gel pen to create highlights that pop. Number three, using a marker or watercolor base under your colored pencil will help the skin look smoother. Number four, you can use washi tape around your drawing to create clean edges. Number five, oil-based pencils like Faber-Castell Polychromos are better for details than wax-based ones like Caran d'Ache or Prismacolor. Thank you for watching. Like for part three and please don't make fun of my voice. I'm just trying to help you guys. I was storing my colored pencils in these glass jars, but it was too hard to keep track of how many pencils I had of each color. I made this block first, but it was too long and there wasn't enough room for all the pencils. So for my final design, I made a block for each set of colors. So far it's working out and I really like how it looks.
is a little story time, but this has actually happened on multiple occasions. So a few years ago, this little shop asked me if they could display my artwork, and if they sold any prints, they would get 30% commission which was completely fair. So I brought along my portfolio to show them my work and it had a mixture of watercolour, acrylic and some coloured pencil drawings in there as well, all of which I was proud of. But then they said I had to just pick one of them and then stick with that for the rest of my art career. I could only ever use one material for my whole life. And the reasoning was that you would get caught up in the techniques of one medium and then apply that to another medium. And I just said, what's wrong with that? And they said your work needs to be recognisable. And while I understand where they're coming from, you can do whatever style you want. Have two, three or ten styles. As long as you're happy with the work you create, you'll do amazing things.